Hi, and welcome to our service. If you're new here, you may be wondering who we are and what this church is all about. Well, the heart of the matter is this. We're a group of people doing our best to love God and love those around us. One of the ways we express this love is through worship because our God is truly amazing. He created everything, great and small, and his love for us is incredible, powerful, and completely unconditional. We also spend time looking into His Word, the Bible, and receive practical teaching to guide us along His path in our everyday lives. But it doesn't end when the service is over. Throughout the week, we gather in groups to serve, pray, reach out to our community, and sometimes just to hang out and have fun. Life is full of challenges, and none of us are perfect. But we believe that's one of the reasons God has brought us together. We're all here to help and support each other through each step of life's journey, because nobody should have to travel alone. So thanks for joining us today. No matter who you are, we want you to know you are welcome. Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Let's stand and worship together this morning. Look to the sky, see the rise, lift it on high, the sun
You may be seated. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you this morning. I don't care whether you sing that song in country or rock or even rap it out or with the jazzy feel that we just heard, the truth is still the same. The blood will never, ever lose its power. And I challenge any of you, if you want to write me a rap, I would love to rap in front of you guys. And I know we got somebody here who writes, writes raps. I am just dying to show you guys a 50-year-old man who can still lay down a rap. So if you remember the pandemic time when we were all locked in, I did write my own rap, you know, nice, nice Bible to Ice Ice Baby, and it was just, it really flowed. And I never finished the whole song, but if somebody could come up the last portion of that rap for me, 
Maybe someday, if you're all good little boys and girls, I will wrap out the remainder of nice, nice Bible, okay? But uh, anyways, good to see each and every one of you this morning. We have a few visitors with us. Just let me tell you that um, things are not always this crazy around here. They're usually just a little bit crazier. So, and I haven't started preaching yet, but I can tell you I am all jacked up after being at assembly for a week. So uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer here in just a minute, but I want to point your attention to just a couple coming events. Uh, there's plenty on there for the month of June. It's uh, this summer's always busy. I know folks are traveling and everything. Highland Food Pantry, our time to volunteer there is this coming Tuesday, so if you had signed up on that, please do not forget to be there at 545 for our, our meeting, and then we're usually there for two hours working and stuff, but always, always, always walk out of there with a huge blessing in my heart, just uh, being able to help individuals in need. So if you signed up for that, be there. If you still haven't had an opportunity, the sign-up sheet is out there for the month of July. Uh, get out there and sign up for that. It's an important ministry. It's great to be a part of. This coming weekend is the ladies camp out or camp in. Camp out if you're brave. Camp in if you're not so brave. But the inside of the church will be open. Outside of the church is always open. But ladies, uh, that is this Friday. Uh, if you have questions or comments or anything you want to just kind of ask Kathy about, uh, she'll be in the back. She's kind of heading that up. Uh, SNAZ meals coming up and all the SNAZ people say, Amen. Pancakes are anointed of the Lord. Um, also, you'll see an insert. We are doing our verse of the month. Make sure you take this beautifully written out or typed out with beautiful graphics. June verse of the month, Isaiah 26, 3. Put that in your Bible. Put that on your refrigerator. Most of all, place it in your heart. And I'll be studying that this month. Um, it's not in the bulletin, but I am really excited about next Sunday. I'm not preaching. So we know who the bad ones of the church are. Just, but uh, anyways, I'm not preaching because it is Youth Takeover Sunday. And it's just going to be an anointed time. We love our youth. Amen? And uh, looking forward to that time in the Lord that we're going to share together. It'll be a rocking good time. And I understand we're going to have a great youth evangelist on the, on the premises. So I talked to Hunter this morning. He's... Uh, getting a lot of things in his brain. So be praying for Hunter and the rest of the youth as they come and they share God's message through word, through prayer, through song, and other things that they've got planned. I don't know what all they got planned. I'm just trusting that it's all under control. But I am truly, I need to stop for just a minute and just say I am thankful for the children and the youth of this church. We are blessed as a church family. Amen? And I love our kids and the fire and the excitement that they have. And our young people, it's been a great year for our youth department. Uh, Pastor Tim, Pastor Heather have been doing a great job with a lot of our new youth that are coming. We're seeing quite the explosion. And uh, it's just really a good, a good thing. So um, before we go to the Lord in prayer, if you could just kind of jot in your wind former or write it in your notes, uh, just be in prayer this week for the Duart family. Uh, Dr. Eugenio Duart is one of our Nazarene General Superintendents. Uh, he was doing a uh, district assembly in Georgia, and they got the call early yesterday morning that their youngest son was found dead. So him and his wife went to be with all of them. So if you could just remember Dr. Duarte and his wife and the rest of the family as well. There's, there's no details or anything, but the best thing that we can do as God's people is to lift them up to the Lord. So just remember Dr. Duarte and his family at this time. Let's go to the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord, so thankful and so grateful for your love, for your grace, for your peace, for your mercy, for your joy that you bestow upon each one of us. But Lord, most of all, one of those words that stands out to me each and every time when I know I give thanks daily is that word, mercy. Lord, I am just so thankful today that our mercies are made new each and every day. Lord, we could just stand here all day and shout out kudos to you and we wouldn't even make a dent to, to describe just how great and how mighty you are. And Lord, I just pray today that as we gather as your people, as we look into the word, as we pray together, as we sing together, Lord, just as we worship together, that your name will be elevated in this place. Because whatever is done here today, it's all about you and how we celebrate. But it's also about how we honor you. 
Lord, may we be attentive in this place. May, may we be open to the leading of your spirit in this place. Maybe some of us have walked in here and hey, it's just been a bad week. It's been a crazy week and our mind is all over the place. Lord, just help us to, to put off the cares and the worries that uh, can sometimes be a huge distraction to us stepping into your presence because we know your presence is already here. But Lord, help us to set aside these things that we call distractions that keep us from hearing what you would have for each one of us. Lord, open open our ears, open our hearts to your leading in this place. Lord, move in this place like never, ever before. Father, we just lift up each, each care, each need, each burden, each hurt that might be just represented in this place. And Lord, may we come to you with open minds, open hearts, open ears, Lord, so that we can just hear from you in a very special and powerful way. Lord, it is my prayer today that uh, as, as the word is spoken, as the songs are sung, that if there is a need, Lord, that you would minister to that need. If there's a calling, let us be obedient to that calling. Lord, let us just be completely open. Let us be overwhelmed. Let us be completely consumed by your presence. And one of the key words in the message today, I guess what I'm asking, Lord, can we just have a fresh encounter in this place today? Lord, meet us right where we are at and overwhelm us. Press in on us and consume us in this place. Lord, I just lift up each and every one that's here today. Those that are watching online, those that cannot be here today, Lord, we ask that you bless them in a very special and mighty way. And Lord, as our Nazarene family that is a global family, Lord, we are thankful for our denomination. We are thankful for a denomination that stands completely on the word of God. And we do not try to detract from it. We just try to live by it. So, Lord, we are thankful for our Nazarene family. When I say Nazarene family, that is global. We think of our general superintendent, Dr. Eugenio Duarte, this morning. We think of his precious wife. We think of their family at this time, this, this devastating loss that they are experiencing. Lord, I, I've ministered to people through the years who have lost children. And, Lord, it's just one of those things we are not wired to bury our children. And I can't imagine the pain and the grief that they must be experiencing right now. But I know one thing about the Dwarf family, is that their hearts and their minds and their attention is always aimed at you. So Lord, press in on them today. Minister to them in a very special and a powerful way. And if at any time their hearts just may be overcome with the grief, may they just become overcome by your peace. So, Lord, love on the Dwarf family today. And, Father, be with us during this time as we worship together. Lord, we just love you. We praise you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say together, amen. Well, God is so good. We've heard some amazing reports coming out of District Assembly this week. God's doing some mighty things through our uh, Virginia Nazarene District and our new missions president. Uh, we've been talking, Catherine Matowski here. Yes, give her a round of applause. There, there you go. She, she has taken on the task of being our new mission president here in the church. And one of the things we talked about is she'd like to take uh, just a, a moment each month just to kind of share with the church family about emphasis. This is how we educate you as to what is going on in the Nazarene church. I am thankful that one of our core values in the Church of the Nazarene is that we are a missional people. Thank you. Um, I'm nervous, so if I stutter... Forgive me, because um, God has a sense of humor. I'm not a public speaker, and here I am. Um, yeah, in my role as missions president, I want to make sure that as a church we're more engaged in missions, because missions is um, deeply rooted in the Nazarene church. As Pastor said, um, when it was organized, there were two central themes. One was unity and holiness, and the other was mission to the world. Um, so we're going to watch a short video real quick and watch. going to listen to him too. Making connections.
Missions is at the heart of the Church of the Nazarene. It defines who we are, and making Christ-like disciples in the nations is our mission, our calling. From the very beginning, we have prayerfully sent missionaries into the world with Christ's transformational love. Nazarene missions exist to establish and support local Nazarene churches around the world. Our belief is that through a well-organized group of believers, local communities can be transformed. Our work focuses on facilitating opportunities, making connections, and developing relationships through every church. Every church is provided with ongoing resources that help the church be effective in ministry and outreach. To make Christ-like disciples, mission centers around the three areas of compassion, evangelism, and education, focusing on the heart, soul, and mind of people in every nation. Each of these methods are interconnected, working hand in hand to bring restoration, share the gospel, and build sustainability within each community. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We are answering this call. Nazarene Missions is a movement of God through the people of God. So you can see from the video, there's a lot going on in the Nazarene Church as far as missions and expertise. Um, just a fun fact I learned this weekend, and I want to I thank you. Um, the church did allow me to go to the assembly, district assembly, and the um, missions conference and it was very informative. I learned a lot, so thank you. Um, we actually in the Nazarene Church have been so successful in missions that currently 65% of Nazareans are actually outside of the United States today. Um, but what exactly is missions? I mean, we've all heard, we all know, okay, we're sent, you know, people go to foreign countries, they share the gospel with folks who haven't heard it. Um, but there's so much more to missions and that's what I want to cover in these missions moments. Um, this is our first one. Hopefully each month I'll have the pastor allow me a few minutes each month um, to come up here and share with you what's going on, not just in the Nazarene church, but also in our church and what we can do. Um, so what is missions? I want to start with pointing to the Bible, Matthew 28, 19, as you all know, the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples all, all, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But at the end of the video, they had a, a verse as well, John 20, 21, where Jesus was speaking, and he said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So yes, sending missionaries out to foreign countries, that is part of missions, but that is not all of it. Um, that's one way. But the Bible doesn't say, well, missionaries go, or pastors go, or some of you go. It just says go. So the implied is that the Great Commission applies to all of us, and we have to have a role in missions as well. But we all can't just pick up and go to foreign countries and be missionaries. That's not what we're called, all called to do. So what we, who aren't called to do that, have to look for what our role here is while we're here in the local church and we're not on the missions field. We actually are on the missions field here. Um, but I'm gonna cover some of our opportunities and introduce you to things and hopefully get some of you engaged throughout the year. Um, but today I'm gonna start with the basics. We do have missionaries in foreign fields. And in the Nazarene Church, they actually have a program called um, uh, prayer or Care and Connection, but I'm jumping ahead on my notes, so let me flip that back. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways that we can support those missionaries out in the field. Three things that I've written down, and this isn't the only three ways, but three that came to my mind is prayer. There's so many challenges that missionaries face that they really need our prayers and the power of God that's tapped into when we pray for them. It opens doors. God hears our prayers. They have needs. We can help them by praying for them. Um, we can provide encouragement for the missionaries themselves. It's very challenging. So they're in a different culture. Sometimes there's political barriers, language barriers. Some of them have... Um, challenges and where they're located that they're not open to missionaries. Um, there's a lot of things that can discourage the missionaries. So getting encouragement from other Christians is a big thing for them. And the third is to support them financially. Missionaries rely on others for their income. 
So financial support can vary. From, their financial income can vary from month to month and year to year. So having a steady income and not having to worry about their finances helps them focus on what God's actually called them to do on the missions field. So the next question is, who are these people? Who are these missionaries? I personally don't know any Nazarene missionaries, um, but the Nazarene Church has a program called Care and Connection, and for anybody who's been around for a while, that's formerly the Lynx program. They've changed the name, and um, they've changed the format of Care and Connection a little bit, so we, have, we will have one global missionary that's assigned to us. We don't have that missionary assigned yet because it's a new program, but we, do have, we will have at least one um, missionary from within our district that's assigned to us, and I want to introduce you to the Domino's family. So that is Jim and Ang Angela Domrose. They are a missionary that's been, a team that's been assigned to our church. Um, they're there with their children, JJ, who's 14, and Gracie, who's 11. And they've just recently deployed to Paraguay in South America. Jim is originally from my area, Buffalo, New York. And Angela is originally from Bogota, Colombia. And right now, I reached out to them, wanted to give you an update about what's happening with them right now. Um, they're living in an apartment in the city of Enc Encarnacion in Paraguay, which is along the Parana liver, River in southern Paraguay. JC and Gray Gray, JJ and Gracie attended Christian school, and they're taught in Spanish, and they're doing well. Right now, the focus for Jim and Angela is on training youth and planting a church. So pray for them in that. But specifically, these, these are the things that they've asked for prayer. So as they're supporting church family, Please take some time to pray for them. And I have uh, made up some flyers if you want to take this with you. It's going to be on the door, um, on the table just outside the door when you leave the, the sanctuary. It lists their prayer needs. Um, they, they ask that we would pray for, that they would hear and follow God's direction with wisdom and clarity. That God would give Jim help in learning Spanish. While Angela is a native speaker, Jim doesn't know any Spanish. And then that God would give them spiritual strength and boldness as there's a lot of spiritual opposition where they are. And um, just on a last note, as far as financially supporting them, you're welcome to make donations to them at any time. So any donation you make, you can just mark the donation for the Domrose in the collections box. Um, but I do want to also call out that our missions march that we do every, more, every Sunday morning, those funds will be going to the Domrose as well. Thank you. Well, as she just said, one of the ways that we give the missions is through our ki children's money march where they come collect all your loose change. So kids, if you're ready, come get the cups and let's do shake everybody down for missions.
Ephesians says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. You may be dismissed for junior church at this time. I guess I might need my Bible to preach out of, huh? <laughs> well, turn in your Bibles to, well, if you're a note taker, just be ready because we are going to take a look at quite a few different texts today, but turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 7, and I assure you we will get there at some point today. 
But you see the title of today's message on your wind farmer. You see it on the screen. It's just simply entitled Encounter. And there's a subtitle that lies underneath that, and it's called Finding God in Your Mess. I don't know about you, whether your life is hunky-dory or whether you're going through something horrible. My prayer is that myself and you will have an encounter. And I'm not talking an encounter with your mess, an encounter with your situation, not an encounter with your neighbor, not an encounter even with me, although it's nice to fellowship, amen? But what I'm specifically talking about today is an encounter with God. Could that be just be the prayer of every moment of our life, Lord, I want an encounter with you? Could that just be the longing of our heart today? Lord, I want an encounter with you. I'm sick of all the junk that surrounds me, Lord. I just want an encounter with you. I don't know about you, but when it comes to God, because I know there's plenty of God to go around. I'm glad you guys aren't sitting real close. Apparently, I'm spitting today. The way the lights are, I can just see the fountain flowing. But I just want, as I say, I know there's plenty of God to go around, but here's how I work my relationship with God. I want to be selfish with him. I want all of him that I can even take on. Amen? Shouldn't that be our every desire? God, I want more of you than ever before. I want all that I can even handle. Lord, overwhelm me. I tell you guys all the time, as your pastor, I pray that prayer for you. Lord, overwhelm my church family. And quite often, I will mention you by name as I'm going down this list, and I say, Lord, whatever's going on in the context of their life today, overwhelm them with your presence. And so often, I've heard people say, hey, I'll shoot random texts. You've probably received them here and there. If you haven't, don't worry. You're on my list because the Lord works at certain times. And he says, hey, let them know they were prayed for today. And I'll shoot a text, and more often than not, when I shoot a text, hey, the Lord pressed you into my spirit today, wants you to know you've been covered in prayer. And I almost always get the same reply. It's like you all have this text that you copied, and you're just waiting to paste it. And it says, Pastor, you don't know what that meant to me when you sent that. So often, don't you love this? God working in your life to the point where he presses you, your name, your family, onto the heart of a fellow brother or sister in Christ, and you get a text or you get a card or whatever, and it comes at the time you seem to need it the most. Don't you love the prompting of God in your life? You know what this is? This is one of many encounters that God loves to deal in. I love to encounter God on the road that that's, I call my journey of life. I have so many God encounters. Some people call it God winks, God hugs, God affirmations, whatever you call it. I style my life and my thinking as a journey because I was born once before, and I started breathing, and then I started walking, and I started this course of my life, and I'm walking through my life. Guess what? I'm not as young as I used to be when I was first born. I know I act like I'm maybe just a few years away from I was just born because that's my maturity level, and I'm okay with that. I own that. I'm happy with that. Sometimes I act two. Sometimes I act three. But my average acting age is around six. Or am I giving myself too much credit? I'm pretty much spot on, aren't I? And I'm okay with that. In fact, in my first preaching class, I loved it when the professor said, if you want to be successful at proclaiming the word and preaching to people, you need to preach at a sixth grade level. Yes. I am almost there. I can do this preaching thing because I am so simple-minded. Don't say amen. I already know how you feel about me. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's kind of disheartening. I know, isn't it great? I, you love me the way that I am. Right where I'm at, yeah. Second grade, fourth grade, I don't know. But when he said, if you want to be a successful preacher, 
preach like you're talking to sixth graders. Hey, some of you act like sixth graders. Yeah, see? We're not all perfect in this place, maybe four or five of you, but I'm not going to mention your name. I don't want your head to swell. But God has this way of working in and through our lives, and he is constantly sending us encounters. I believe he sends us these encounters as reminders as to his love and his devotion to us. Can we stop there for just a second and rest in this thought of who God is? In your own thinking, take a moment and think about how big he is. I bet there's not one of you in that moment that could even touch the surface of his bigness and his greatness. Let's just take just a few seconds. I want you to think of it this way. God, in all of his power, go. You need more time, don't you? Because when you think of the almighty power of God and what that actually entails, am I okay, am I right in saying that our God's the biggest there is, the best that there is, the strongest that there is? Am I right in saying that our God is all-powerful? Am I right in saying that our God is all-knowing? Am I right in saying that our God is everywhere? Okay, so are we in agreement this morning that he's the great big God? And we, we don't have enough words in our language and all the other languages to combine to talk about how all-powerful and how mighty he truly is, do we? We combine all of that. We can't scratch the surface. And here's what I love about this. He loves you and he loves me so much, he's willing to take time to set up an encounter for you. Am I the only one? He takes the time to set up an encounter so that you can receive a blessing. Wow. I think our mind, our hearts, our attention needs to be on, Lord, I want an encounter with you. God sends encounters, and those are amazing things, but when we walk towards the encountering times with God, those encounters get bigger. They get grander. Woo! The more you walk towards him, the more you will encounter him. Now, I'm a firm believer in the provenient grace of God. I'm glad it's one of our articles of faith. If you don't know what provenient grace is, it's the grace that goes before. He's in your tomorrow working. My focus is on the fact that I'm living in the here and now, and he's already here, right here with me. But he's in tomorrow. I don't know how that works. Maybe it's a Star Trek thing. Scotty beams him everywhere. I don't know. Star Trek, for some of you that are young, one of the best shows ever on TV, only made it to like 68 episodes. Don't know why it didn't go longer. Hey, see? Got some righteous people up here with us today. It's just one of those shows that's so stinking cheesy, it should have never went off the air. I mean, and look at some of the filth we have on the air way too long. And all God's people said, amen. 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 If we could just get back to Captain Kirk and the little fuzzy thing. <laughs> amen. Amen. I can't remember what they're called. <laughs> Dribbles, okay. We got some sanctified people up in the house today. <laughs> really, really, really good. Really, really good. But our, co our, the, our context should be God only. Amen? Hey, God, give me an encounter. God, I'm running towards you. I want to run head first into you and to what you are doing. And that is our theme for this year. Lord, interrupt what we are doing so that we can be a part of what you are doing. And I think we're doing a pretty good job of it this year. I would be okay if God somehow threw a message up here real quick, because God can even work through technology. We know that the enemy works through technology quite often. Amen? But wouldn't you love it if God literally would interrupt my sermon with something on the screen, and Pastor Tim's back there on the computer going, 
What's going on? What's going on? Well, wouldn't you love it if this message said, okay, Winchester Church, I need your pastor to quit preaching, and I need you to go to this address and be Jesus. Hey, Pastor Tim's right there with me. Side note, that was my test to see if Pastor Tim stayed awake during the services. <laughs> now we all know Pastor Tim's awake. But here's my thought. We get so used to doing things a certain way, and we have this certain dynamic of what we expect and how it should play out. Sometimes we can get so mired and stuck in that, that if a message would come aboard like that, how many of us would be saying, he hasn't dismissed yet. He hasn't said the final amen yet. And doesn't he know that Golden Corral, the line gets really busy at 1215? God, I cannot go and do. How obedient would we be when God ex wants us to experience a special encounter? You ever wonder sometimes if you're missing it? You ever wonder sometimes if the church is missing it? The encounter? Read with me, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, starting in verse 11. My heading is simple. It just says what we're about to hear. If my people, all bold print. Verse 11, 2 Chronicles says this, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night of the day and he said, I have heard your prayer. You can hear that prayer in chapter 6. And I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Verse 13 says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their land, forgive their sin and heal their land. Verse 15 says, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. Don't you love this? And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded and commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then will I establish your royal throne as I have covenanted with David your father, saying, you shall not lack man to rule Israel. This text is one of many we're going to look at today. I'm going to roll right through these. But that text is literally a promise from God. That says this, if you, if you, the church, if you, God's people, will do your part, catch this, then God will fulfill the promise. Can I paraphrase that just to make it a little bit simpler? If we honor him as individuals, if we honor him as a church, this wording is just almost too much for my mind, then the God of all creation, the God who is all-powerful, the God who is all-seeing, all-knowing, and everywhere at once will do this. He will give you a return on your investment. Think of this. This God will honor you. He will bless you. He will bless your efforts. Ooh, man. Am I the only one blessed by that? All you have to do is fulfill your end of the deal. And the context of the scripture hangs on that two-letter word that I talk about a lot, if. See, this is where we miss it so often as individuals and even collectively as a body. So often, we're so busy, we're so distracted that we lose 
the if of the blessing. I don't know if that made sense. It made sense in my sixth grade mind. If my people, I don't even know what he's speaking to you about in your own private context of your private life. But I do know we're all on different walks at different times. And if God's calling you to something, if God's asking you of something or about some, to do something, if he's requiring something of you, if he's calling you to something and you don't hold up your end of the deal, guess what? You miss out. You miss out on the blessing of God. Because the whole context of that scripture says, if, it's not freely tossed down to us, although that'd be great to be rewarded for nothing, amen? No effort, but we are blessed. God never even comes alongside us and says, you will do it, or else. See, this goes back to that free will of God, this self-will. And I'm sure there's days he probably says, I wish I wouldn't have done that. But see, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times, God's a gentleman and he won't force his will on you. But something changes in the equation of the relationship when you are willing to come to him. And this God that we've been thinking about, the bigness of him, wants you to come to him. He longs for you. He has a desire for you. And if you will just come to him, if you will just honor him, he will bless you and he will honor you. That's big stuff. The God of all creation aiming honor at you. Man, but I'm sure there's times in our life that he's like, if I could kick him in the seat of the pants right now, I would. We don't know what he thinks. But that's where my mind goes. Parents, you just want to kick your kid in the seat of the pants. Just being real up in here, amen? <laughs> Courtney, if you ever just want to kick your husband in the seat of the pants, <laughs> amen? But it's true. It's true. Discipline is an act of love. Oh, man. It is. I know that my third grade principal showed me love when he paddled me. When I did the whole elbows on the table, I found out that Mr. Colmer could swing and hit the fence. It hurt. I learned my lesson. From then on, I showed the man respect. Because <laughs> I really didn't like the whole place your elbows on your table and you waited. And he had the holes in his paddle. You hear the air going through that when you're awaiting that smack. You know that the wind up is kaboof, kaboof. Anyways, let's, uh, I might need some help from some of you. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> counsel me. But if we honor him, look at all the key words in that whole text. I got a whole lot of scripture to get through. I better keep going. These key words, chosen, if, called, humble, pray, seek, turn, hear, forgive. He will heal and he will consecrate. You know what I get from that? He will consecrate himself to bless us back. He will set himself aside to bless us back. <laughs> you mean God will actually take time out of his busy schedule and pencil me in, set himself aside and bless me? He will. He'll celebrate you. You know what's even better than that? Well, that's getting ahead of myself. That's here in a few scriptures. I better not do that. Sometimes a car salesman can talk themselves out of a sale. Sometimes a, a preacher can preach themselves out of a sermon. Amen? Just being real. Let's go to Acts. Here's a quick quiz. What's today's date? June 5th. Anybody have a clue what day this is? Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday. Boy, if we want to talk about encounters, talk about Pentecost Sunday. And I'm going to blow your mind, okay? It's Pentecost Sunday. 
if you've been in my ministry at any time for any short amount of time, where's my favorite area to preach from? Acts. More specifically, Acts chapter. I'm not even going to spend the bulk of my time there today. Shocker, I know. But we have to look at it because it fits with where the Lord has led me to today. This early church, these early believers, actually, go to Acts chapter 1. We'll go there, then we'll go to Acts chapter 2. This, this early church, these early believers, they had a longing, they had a yearning, and they had an, assi they had an assignment. You know who gave them this assignment? It was Jesus Christ himself. He gave them literal instruction to go somewhere, and they went. I had a sermon, I think it was about a year ago, I told you all, whenever Jesus tells you to be somewhere, go. Because if you go where he tells you to go, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have an encounter. Because you obeyed. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Bear with me, I'm reading out of a new Bible. It's an older Bible that I bought some time ago, but I've actually never used it because if you did not know this, I collect different kinds of Bibles. That's just my love. I, we all collect different things. I love to collect the Word of God. If you're going to collect anything, collect the Word of God. Amen? But this version I, I don't use very often. It's the ESV, the English Standard Version. And I, as I was, like I typically do, I love to see what every version has to say about a certain text. And I love the wording that we're going to look at here in just a minute. But Acts chapter 1, verse 4. While they, and while staying with them, Jesus ordered them. He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, I love this, it's in quotes, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit many days from now. Verse 6 says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive holy you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men stood before them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And when he returns, whew, what a sight that's going to be. Amen. When they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, it's not the Nazarene University, so Jesus did not do all of this in Illinois. Okay, For you serious Nazarenes and for some of you that are Olivet people, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, all these that we just mentioned, were in one accord, and they were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So he gave this, this instruction to them to go to Jerusalem. He said, do not depart from there. And he did promise that something would come following. It would be this precious gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so they go. They do not depart from Jerusalem. They go to that upper room. And the other part of Jesus' instruction, he told them where to go and what to do. Note, he did not say, have a prayer meeting. He said, wait. Sometimes the best waiting is in prayer. <laughs> Amen? Go there and wait. So they went and they devoted themselves to prayer. And then if you flip just a, well, I guess it's on the same page in my Bible. If you got the same Bible I do, it's on page 1,453. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together. Where were they? They were in that one place. 
And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit came upon that prayer meeting. Everything done from there on out by these prayer warriors who founded the literal first church of the Nazarene. You know how I know it was the first church of the Nazarene? Well, first we know that it's the first church established in that prayer meeting. Amen? Amen? And secondly, who gave the instruction to go have the prayer meeting? Jesus the Nazarene. Yay, Nazarenes. Yay, Nazarenes. <laughs> I don't even know why I do that sometimes, but it's fun, isn't it? But that was the literal first church of the Nazarene because they were under the jurisdiction of Jesus, the first ever general superintendent of the church of the Nazarene. He gave the orders, he told them where, they did, and he showed up and blessed. But here's the deal. What were they waiting on? What were they praying about? They were praying about an encounter. And this is where I think we miss it as individuals. This is where I think we miss it as churches across, uh, across the whole. And even there are Nazarene churches that aren't perfect. We know this one is. Can I get an amen? Oh, you know why I didn't get many amens? Because we ain't perfect. Just your pastor. <laughs> You're right, I'm not perfect either. I better just, <laughs> side note, I am not perfect, okay? I look good, I'm just not perfect. <laughs> Sometimes you all can be rude. So let's jump back mentally real quick. Verses 12 and 14 in chapter 1. When they went back to Jerusalem, just as Jesus had instructed them, they didn't go back and play video games. They didn't go to the refrigerator, grab a Dr. Pepper. They didn't call DoorDash and order in and have an all-night Star Wars marathon. No. Because we all know DoorDash didn't exist back then, right? They didn't go back on, and get on their Facebooks and say, well, we're here in the upper room, just waiting for something big to happen, just as Jesus said. They didn't do any of that. They went to the Father. They, were, they approached the throne of grace. They got in touch with the King of kings, Lord of lords. And they had an encounter that changed their life. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to jump here to verses 42 through 47. The key ingredient that we always talk about on the day of Pentecost the happening, what was going on. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. Verse 43, and awe, A-W-E, awe came upon the, every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, they, they consecrated themselves, they set themselves aside for God. And they honored God in all that they said, all that they did, and God just went. <laughs> I think at one moment, even God said, Whew, there's a lot of blessings. And he just kept bestowing blessing upon blessings and addition and addition and multiplication and multiplication. And it just kept exploding from there. Why? Because their attention was on an encounter. It was on an encounter with God. But so often in life, we can miss this boat that leads us straight into an encounter because we get so caught up in ourselves. We get so distracted by so many things. Just bear with me for a second. got to get something. 
And so often in life, we get distracted by all of these things that weigh us down. And, uh uh-oh, somebody did their job and emptied the trash. I needed a full trash can, but I'm just going to act this out. Hunter, will you help me? We'll just throw a bunch of things in here. Let's just consider this stuff trash, okay? Hunter, I'm asking you to have an encounter here. You and I both. You get on your knees there. We're going to act something out. Oh, we got to make sure everybody can see us. Everybody see us? Okay, let's just pretend. Whew. Let's just pretend that the church just had a dinner. Have you ever looked into a trash can at the end of a church fellowship? It does not look as nice. It does not present as well in the trash can as it did when the thing first began. Amen? And let's go, Hunter. So often we have these things that I would call the trash of our life that, well, what's a trash can for? To throw trash away. I don't believe anybody has a plan to go back through their trash. Because once it hits the trash can and certain things start to spoil, it's not as pleasing the smell, is it? It's not as pleasing to touch. It's not as pleasing to look at. And my question is, why do we, as believers, why do we, as the church, say that we give it to God only to go back through and pick it back out again? See, that's not trusting. You can be dismissed. See, for those of you who don't know, Hunter accepted a call to ministry. And he's, he's, on, he's on the beginning ground. And the reason I wanted you to help me dig through trash, I wish it would have been nasty. I wanted it to be slimy and disgusting. I should have told Bob the other day, hey, don't empty the kitchen trash. <laughs> and, and here's the deal. I, I wanted Hunter to be able to share some stories in his ministry. Let me tell you about this goofball pastor I once had. In the middle of the sermon, he had me digging out slimy, nasty, stinking trash to prove a point. But then he could follow up with this. It was a good point that we as Christians say we've given it to God. We call this trash of our life things we have given to God. The problem is when we say that we've given it to God so often... See where I'm going with this? We don't let go of it completely because we don't trust him enough. And see, trusting is a form of an encounter. My first day on the job as a full-time minister was as a youth pastor. And you would think that my first day as a youth pastor would be one of those going to a school event, reaching out to a youth, planning a cool, flashy youth sermon for Wednesday night and My first day on the job as a full-time minister was this. Standing out in front of the churchyard. I got this call the night before. Pastor Steve said, wear your work clothes. It's going to get nasty tomorrow. My first day on the job, the church was having a leach bed issue where the sewage drained out into the country field. And so that had to be righted. The situation needed to be fixed. How do you do that a lot of times? You try to go to the source of the problem. And boy, when that shovel started piercing the ground and this brown stuff just started seeping up around my feet. (laughs) 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 That was my first day as a minister, okay? And every church ministry since then, every charge that I have had, you know, at one time or another, I have been digging through trash why because people it's humbling one well because i love my people so much when they lose a piece of jewelry that means the world to them or a teenager throws away their two thousand dollar retainer 
and mom or dad calls the church and says, has the trash been taken out yet? No. Well, I'm pretty sure she threw her retainer away. Or this person, an adult calls and says, my wedding rings from my deceased husband, I took them off while we were doing the dishes after the dinner yesterday. Tell me the trash hasn't been tossed out. I'm like, no. And it just happened in this church. We had a precious young lady lose a ring. I had no problem as the pastor going, let's see what I can do. For those of you that don't know what that looks like, it looks like this. Oh, man. I have done that in every ministry that I've ever been blessed with outside of the first one, which I will take trash cans over standing in sewage any day. Can I put it this way? That's an encounter. Sometimes the encounter of God is not always neat, tidy, and smelling good. Well, Pastor, are you saying you got blessed because maybe you found something? I am pleased to note that on every occasion, the item was in the trash except for this one. It was somewhere else. But hey, I enjoyed the trash. I saw all you've been up to during church. But at the end of it all, something was found. And here's the deal. It's not always pleasant getting there. Sometimes it's extremely difficult to get there. But in the middle of your mess, God will be there. In the middle of your mess, God will be there. How do I know this? Because God's in the messy. Amen? How do I know God's in the messy? He dealt with me. How do I know God's in the messy? He's dealt with you. We've all had junk in our life. We've all had trash in our life. And let's just face it, we as people can get into a mess. Am I the only one that's ever been in a mess? Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10 says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Verse 9, I want you to hang on to this today. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Do not grow weary of doing good. What in the world does that have to do with Pentecost? What in the world does that have to do with anything that began this whole message? What does that have to do with the book of Acts? I know what I always preach of out of the book of Acts. And why did I specifically pick the, uh, the ESV version for today? Because I like the wording. There's, there's these three words linked together that I absolutely loved in the whole thing. I'm always reading out of the NIV, NIV nine out of ten times. And it always says daily. But the ESV version says can I just read it to you? Day by day. See, the early church, the early believers, they believed in finding an encounter. And when you read the book of Acts, it doesn't say they experienced this encounter on Sunday at 10.45 a.m. You, know you know what came as a result of their day by day devotion? their day-by-day day praying, their day-by-day day worshiping, their day-by-day day fellowshipping, their day-by-day day trusting in the Lord, an encounter with God. It does not say that they waited till Sunday or even Wednesday night at 7 o'clock to give God their best. They were seeking an encounter 
day by day. And if you read at the end of verse 47, Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the Lord added to their number Sundays and Wednesdays. Wrong answer if you believe that. It says the Lord added to their number. Can I, can I change that? The Lord blessed them day by day. They're the blessing of God that happened day by day was a result of day by day devotion. Man. Do not, do not grow weary of doing good. Do it day by day. You know what? If you guys are okay with this, I got so much more to say. Is it okay if the next time I stand before you, we continue in Galatians chapter 6? Because I just felt like the Lord has a lot more for me to say all of a sudden. And I mean a lot more. And you know, my a lot more can really, my a lot more can drag on for a very long time. I actually think the Lord just gave me two sermons out of this. So can I encourage you with this? Do something day by day. You know what that is? Doing good day by day. As you leave today, can I encourage you to pray day by day? As you leave here today, can I, can I encourage you to trust him day by day? Can I encourage you as good little boys and girls of the church to read your Bible day by day? Can I just encourage you, your own little pocket of the world, to go out and be Jesus day by day? Can I encourage you? That's a lot of homework, isn't it? That's all right, it's my sermon. I'm the teacher, you're the students, do what I say. <laughs> actually, actually, Kathy, it does work in my context because I'm the preacher of God's Word. And God's Word tells me to do it day by day. And if you call yourself a Christ follower, you'll do it day by day. So can I just sum all that up? When you leave here today, First off, we know that the enemy will be at the door waiting on you. As our general superintendent said yesterday, he'll be waiting on the door to interrupt what just happened. <laughs> I'm going to ask you guys to do something silly. Make sure as you're leaving, first time I've ever asked you to do anything like that, right? As you're leaving today, as a visible sign to the enemy, and make sure there's at least three feet in front of you when you go to the front door. That's rebuking the enemy. Now, I want to get to the door to see how many people actually get kicked. No. I want to watch the enemy get the beat down, however many people are here that many times. Amen? Let's beat down the enemy day by day. And the Lord will bless you day by day. Heavenly Father, as we go from this place today, Lord, we do know. And we're not stupid to the fact that we know the enemy is prowling. We know the enemy is stalking. And all he wants to do is to seek, to kill, and destroy all the joy and all the peace that we have. So, Lord, as we go from this place, I just want to pray on everybody's behalf. In Jesus' name, we rebuke the enemy. Not only for today, Lord, but day by day. Lord, as we honor you in our lives this week, as we live out day by day, Lord, overwhelm us with your presence and your blessings day by day, because we know your word tells us, assures us, and promises that you are the faithful God. And Lord, we proclaim our love for you in this place today. Now, Lord, strengthen us, encourage us, and embolden us as we go out and do war in this world that we live. Let us be the salt and light. Father, we love you. We praise you. 
And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people say together, amen. God bless each and every one of you. Have an amazing, amazing week. Thanks for sharing your Sunday.